here. So, so good evening. Uh, my name is Maria Sedeno. And on behalf of Recipe Plus, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, it's the name for the webinar is the Unmet Needs in Chronic Cough Medical Education, an interactive ca case-based discussion. And this will be presented by Dr. Imran Satya and Elena Kum, uh, who is an MD PhD student at McMaster University. Um, and we're very pleased to offer this continuing education opportunity, which is made possible by an unrestricted sponsorship from Merck Canada. Um, a couple of technical aspects. Uh, tonight, we expect this to be a very interactive session. So if you have any questions, you have a couple of options. You can use the uh, Q&A, uh, the section that you have at the bottom of your screen. Or if you want to actually verbalize and ask a question live, you can also raise your hand and I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself so that you can ask the question. But for those who are connecting via the phone, unfortunately, the, the phone line can only remain muted during the session, okay? And that cannot be unmuted. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available for, for viewing via YouTube and also in our website, www.expandcourses.com. And you will uh, having uh, an email that will give you all the instructions next week. And also we'll give you um, actually an attestation for your participation tonight, okay? Um, so then let's uh, welcome to our guest tonight. So Dr. Imran Satya, he is an internationally renowned expert in the field of chronic cough. He is currently an assistant professor at McMaster University for the Department of Medicine Division of Respirology. He completed his medical degree at the University of Cambridge, UK, and also completed a PhD at the University of Manchester. He was a co-author on the most recent ERS chronic cough guidelines and is scientific advisor for pharmaceutical companies developing new cough therapies. He has been invited as uh, an invited speaker at national and international medical conferences and has authored numerous publications on the mechanism and treatment of cough. Elena Kuhn is a first year MD PhD student at McMaster University. Her research work includes developing an outcome measure to assess cough severity, leading a dose response meta analysis investigating the safety and effectiveness of P2X3 antagonists, and conducting clinical trials evaluating the effectiveness of currently available therapies for patients with chronic cough. We also have Vincent Lee and Etri Kosachi, who are also medical students at McMaster University. I really thank you for joining us tonight. And with that, I'm gonna let the, the ground to uh, Dr. Imran Satya. Thank you. Good afternoon, good, e good evening, everyone. I'm not sure where all of you are joining in from. I hope uh, there's people from Ontario, but maybe from other provinces as well. So uh, thank you all very much for attending. Um, and thank you very much, Maria, for organizing and inviting me and uh, Eleanor and Vincent and Etri from McMaster. So the first thing I want to point out to the audience members is that this is something which I want to try. And this is the first time I'm actually trying something quite different, which is to make this more of an interactive, conversation-based discussion, teaching session around chronic cough. Um, and, and that's why it's important that uh, I can hear from you as well, or in the chat function, or, or if you want to unmute yourself, please, please, please feel free to do so. Um, these are my disclosures. And these are my financial disclosures of support from Recipe Plus uh, and Merck for this uh, CME. So the main learning objectives uh, for this session for the next hour or so are threefold. Firstly, is to go into an in-depth um, measurement, assessment, investigations and treatment of chronic cough. Then talk briefly about the current treatment options for refractory and unexplained chronic cough and, and go through the evidence and, and really make you understand what, what, it, what, what refractory and unexplained truly is. And then very briefly at the end, touch upon what are the future options. Um, so to make this a case-based discussion, I thought uh, I'd bring a case that I've recently seen, uh, and perhaps uh, I'd like 
um, if it's possible for maybe one of the medical students or each of the medical students to read one paragraph. Um, and then maybe uh, for the purpose of the audience and discussion, if there's anything which you think is interesting in that paragraph or particularly relevant for the treatment of chronic cough or investigations, just point it out to me and, and uh, we, can, uh, uh, we can talk about it. So, um, Ellen, do you want, you're, you're first on my panel. Uh, so do you want to firstly maybe just read through the first paragraph and identify things which you think might be important? Absolutely, sure. Uh, thanks, Dr. Sadia. So I'll start. Uh, Mr. Khalil is a 46-year-old male who presents to your office for three years of dry chronic cough. He is an ex-smoker of six pack years, stopped 15 years ago. He has been taking Perondipril for the past five years for hypertension and Resuvastatin for dyslip dyslipidemia. Right. Uh, so something, so, I guess, that stands out. Yeah, go on. So tell me, is there anything within that that pops out at you or which you think is interesting? Or Yeah, um, I think what's interesting is that he's taking an ACE inhibitor and um, ACE inhibitors can cause chronic cough. So that's something in his drug history that stands out to me. Um, he doesn't seem to have, you know, substantial smoking history, um, although he is an ex-smoker. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like he's had this uh, dry cough for many, many years. Mm. For three years, right? Yes. Um, and does it bother you or does it, is it interesting for you that the, the, the ACE inhibitor he's been on for five years and the cough's only for three years? Because some people say, well, you know, there doesn't seem, you know, there was a two year period, but he didn't cough at all on the ACE inhibitor. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The timelines don't really match up. Um, Completely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Vincent, on the first paragraph, do you have any comments or thoughts which caught your eye? No, not not other than the ones Elena mentioned. No. And Etri, do you have any comments um, on on this first paragraph that you thought might be interesting? Yeah, I think one thing is the quality of the cough is something that we're often asked yeah. to think about in yeah. medical school. So it says Good. dry. And often when someone's a smoker, sometimes I think of a disease called COPD um, that comes from, um, usually in my knowledge, limited medical knowledge, yeah. is that it's more of a wet cough with some sort of white sputum that it produces. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really important observation, the fact that this person's had a dry cough, not a productive cough. Because in people with COPD who are current smokers, they often get something called chronic bronchitis, which is productive cough and phlegm. Um, on a common basis. So, so those are two very important points. So Vincent, do you want to read the second paragraph and then we can go from there? Yeah, sure. He says his cough persisted following an upper respiratory tract infection and did not improve despite a five-day course of az azithromycin and two weeks of fluticasone, pro propionate, and salbutamol meter dose inhaler prescribed by his family doctor. So um, what jumped out to me is that he has a three-year history of chronic cough that started after a respiratory tract infection, which after three years should have been resolved by now, you know, especially given that it was treated by antibiotics. So why is the cough still persisting? Is there something else that's causing it? Yeah. And um, I think the other point is um, he has been tried on steroids as well as, you know, the Saba, which mm -hmm. presumably was to, you know, potentially to treat a reversible cause of asthma. And since he's trialed that, it doesn't really have any improvement. Does it, does it mean that there's less likely to be asthma that's causing to his chronic cough? Do, do you think that the two weeks of treatment of fluticasone and salbutamol, do, do you think that would be enough treatment for you to think uh, it probably isn't asthma or it didn't get better, you know? Do you think that's? Yeah, I, I, my guess would be with the salbutamol at least, like it would, it would at least show some relief in the cough, like you know, more, more, um, uh, you know, like more immediately that the, uh, the steroids might take a little longer. Just, uh, but uh, my understanding is that the steroid is more of a, um, like a prevention to keep to keep the asthma under control. Yeah. So the fluticasone is an inhaled steroid, and sometimes you know, it takes a longer time for it to, to kick into effect. Um, whereas the salbutamol is more short acting and, and in people who do have asthma, maybe it, 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 you're expected to work over a short period of time. Um, Etri, do you want to go through the third paragraph? 
Of course, yeah. Um, he complains of occasional nasal stuffiness, sneezing, as well as anterior and posterior rhinoneura with frequent throat clearing occurring after meals, drinking hot or cold beverages, or with sudden changes in environmental temperature. In addition to his throat clearing, he has episodes of coughing fits that can last several minutes, which will rarely lead to retching and vomiting. He complains of heartburn and regurgitation following heavy meals or alcohol ingestion, occurring on average once or twice a month. He denies any wheezing, chest tightness, sputum production, or shortness of breath. So actually, is there anything which you think is interesting in the history with regards to this part of uh, the history? Yes. Oh. Yeah, so I, I think um, what comes out for me, one of the things is the wheezing is a very important piece that always comes and is your stereotypical piece that you often think with asthma is this wheeze, um, but also this GERD-like symptoms that he has, this heartburn, this potential regurgitation, um, and, you know, his age as well, um, you know, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, there's further about body habitus down the line <laughs> of the paragraph. Um, yeah. But I do know that sometimes, to my knowledge, that GERD can also contribute further to almost like an irritation. And yeah. sometimes people can have cough. So that's something that, you know, um, dings in my head as another potential. Yeah, that's really excellent. And is in the first part of that, when you're talking about irritation, is there something which kind of makes you wonder in the first sentence, there's something about the family physician saying changes in environmental temperature triggering. Yes, that definitely makes me think for irritation, just because my knowledge, although I'm not sure about the pathophysiology, I'd be interested in knowing that often asthma gets worse in winter or at night, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. will get worse with sort of like these sudden changes. So it's almost what's what's happening it's an inflammation irritation piece and often someone's constantly having runny nose stuffiness there's something going on in that piece um whether allergies are common to have that is something i'm aware of but also other inflammation pieces such as allergy being an inflammation vincent do you have any thoughts on this paragraph or anything which you think is quite interesting particularly about the nature of his cough and something else, which he's also describing here, the family physician is describing. I do wonder just in the, like when you, when you look at the symptoms, nasal stuffiness, the rhinorrhea, like, and the frequent throat carrying, like, is there, it could be a picture of a sinusitis at play as well, like chronic sinusitis and potentially like, you know, a postnatal drip playing, oh, you know, playing yeah. a role in his chronic cough. Yeah. yeah. This is often uh, people describe this, this idea of post-nasal drip where they feel there's something trickling at the back of their throat, like something instead of, you know, when, when you've all developed a runny nose, you often blow your nose and things will come out the front end. But in some people, the liquid and mucus secretion can go backwards and that can lead to coughing. But in this guy, it's interesting that he has both coughing, but he has another phenomenon. Yeah. Eleanor, do you want to point out something? He's got coughing and he's got something else. Yeah, I think um, he seems to have some features of cough hypersensitivity syndrome in that he coughs in response to things that shouldn't normally trigger a cough, like drinking hot or cold beverages or like changes in temperature. Um, so it seems like he's very sensitive to, to triggers. Yeah, true. Excellent. So these are really important points. And what do you think about this idea of throat clearing and coughing? Do, do you think that the same thing, because... He says that in addition to his throat clearing, so throat clearing is people keep <clears throat> doing this and <coughs> coughing is a separate thing, right? So what do you guys think about this idea of regular throat clearing and then coughing on top? What do you think? Um, maybe I can jump in. So to my knowledge, a lot of patients who have chronic cough also have these urge to cough sensations so they can complain of like an irritation in their throat or a feeling of something stuck and I feel like the throat clearing is a result of him having those irritations or sensations in his throat excellent so in so so just to complete the fourth paragraph I'll read it myself so on examination he has a BMI of 32 which I think uh, entry also pointed out uh, and that can make you think that is this good uh, nasal exam doesn't reveal any nasal polyps, which is which is important. An oropharyngeal exam doesn't reveal any abnormalities. Chest auscultation is normal, and there's no clubbing. Okay, and and why is clubbing important? 
Vincent and Etri, maybe Elena might know as well. Or, or if it was clubbing. I'm so clubbing, clubbing is, to my knowledge, is very um, not necessarily like the most sensitive thing. It can occur in quite a variety of different conditions, but um, COPD being one of them, but comes towards like some sort of hypoxia esque state that is occurring and you'll get some sort of digital clubbing, which yeah. I mean, thankfully my fingers don't look clubbed, but my knowledge is it's when it looks almost bulbous at the yeah. bottom of the finger. Yeah. So it looks yeah. Yeah. extended. So, so clubbing can be, uh, there's many causes of clubbing, but um, uh, I normally think of clubbing as there's respiratory causes of clubbing. So things like cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis, but with coughing, you know, you have people with interstitial lung disease like IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis can develop coughing. And lung cancer, TB can all cause, be associated with, with clubbing. For heart diseases, it's most commonly congenital cyanotic heart diseases, infective endocarditis, and a condition called atrial myxoma. So those are three, not common, but you know, cardiac causes. And then there's non-cardiac or GI causes like uh, inflammatory bowel disease, Live, chronic liver disease, um, um, things like uh, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's can cause it as well. So, so these are the kind of common things that are clubbing. But from a respiratory perspective, the fact that there's no clubbing means it kind of it's it's useful to know. But anyways, we're going to carry on. So the first question is, guys, what is chronic cough? Do 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 you know what chronic cough is? I've put it out there. But what is chronic cough to you guys? What do you understand by what chronic cough means? I can jump in. Um, my understanding is a uh, chronic cough is a cough that persists for longer than eight weeks. Yep. Okay, good. And, oh, and I think we have someone who's also raised their hand, one of the attendees, if they want to jump I in. If I can find the participant. I don't know how I can, how I can find it. Uh, attendees. Philip. Yes, so I, I have uh, I have given him the opportunity to speak. Philippe, yes, Yostos. Um, talking permitted. Philippe, do you want to say something? Hello, Philippe? I think you're unmuted. Yeah, but... I, I think I think he is submitted now. Yeah. Yeah. But I can't hear him, but uh, maybe he'll uh, chime in later. So um, so you're right that acute cough is one to three weeks and most likely due to upper respiratory tract infections of bronchitis and pneumonias. Subacute is where there's three to eight week period where the cough can go on and on and on. And, and chronic cough is currently defined as cough more than eight weeks and can be associated with asthma, nasal disease and reflux disease. And if you go back to Mr. Khalil's history, you would have noticed that he did say that I, my cough started after a upper respiratory tract infection and the cough just never went away. And we're also seeing this after COVID that uh, I'm seeing a lot more people who, in interestingly, when they got COVID, they didn't get a bad cough. And then the cough starts about three, two, three weeks after the initial COVID. And then the cough comes and never goes. So that's one thing I've noticed over the last year or so that things have been a slightly different. The, the, you know, it's interesting, this eight-week definition has never always been there. Do, do, do you guys know, anybody considered, you know, why is eight weeks important and not, say, six weeks or four weeks or three weeks for chronic cough or 12 weeks for chronic cough? Why not have it a different time point? Do you know why this eight week was used? Anybody? Anyone know why, why the eight week was used? One of the reasons is uh, related to the fact what I mentioned is viruses. So back in the 80s, there was a guy called Richard Irwin who studied post-viral cough. And he noticed that some people's cough can go on for about until eight weeks. Prior to this, chronic cough was for three weeks or more. Right? So... Then he said, oh, actually, when we follow these people longitudinally, the cough can go on for about eight weeks. So that's one reason. The second reason is that if somebody's still coughing at eight weeks, then that's a good trigger point for the family physician 
to think about doing a chest x-ray because you don't want to wait 12, 14, 15, 16 weeks if somebody's got you know, a cancer or a pulmonary uh, fibrosis or they've got an effusion or they've got TB. So the idea is that you want to bring it forward to about eight weeks so that it prompts somebody to do something about it rather than waiting 12, 14, 16 weeks. So that was another logistical reason why eight weeks was chosen. And, and cough is actually a very common problem. Um, and it's the commonest reason uh, for people going to see a doctor in ambulatory care. This is data from 2010 from US uh, physicians offices. And I rechecked it recently from 2020 and the numbers are almost exactly the same, if not slightly higher. Um, and this is interesting. And I wanted to show this, that cough is a common problem. I'm not sure if you're aware that um, this is the global prevalence of chronic cough is about 10% globally. Um, but what's interesting is that if you look at different continents like Australia, Europe, America, Asia, Africa, the prevalence is from 18% in Australia down to 2% in Africa. Does that surprise any of you? Of what, you know, why is it so variable? Do, you know, what because you might think that maybe in Asia and Africa, you know, China, Korea, Japan, the in India, that prevalence of chronic cough might be more than Europe. But does that does that surprise you? That variability? Are you surprised by that? Eleanor, are you surprised by that? Uh, I'm not, I'm not entirely surprised. I think, um, I'm not sure, you know, at what point do people diagnose a patient with chronic cough? I can imagine the time, like the workup time to finally render a diagnosis of chronic cough could take a while. And for a patient to even, um, you know, see a physician or seek medical care for their chronic cough, it would mean it have it have to bother them, or they would have to perceive it to be bothersome. And I can imagine different cultures may have different views about how much their cough truly bothers them. That's a very very important point, and I think that's that's one important issue um, of why you know although the prevalence on average is ten percent, but in certain countries where there's HIV, TB, you know, in India and Africa, TB is the most common commonest cause right so you'd think they'd have a lot more you know cough and they'd be complaining of cough chronic cough but in fact they're not but the other thing is that there's less studies conducted in those countries as well so it could just be that there's less studies but the other thing is that when we more recently have looked at definitions based on eight weeks even within europe which is a western developed you know continent you've got from four percent in denmark copenhagen to twelve percent so even within like an, a close geographical area, you're seeing variability of four and twelve percent, which is again interesting, and it could be I don't know that it, the, this could represent social cultural differences and how bothersome people actually find the cough. Some people, you know, they have a cough, but it's not bothersome, so they never go to the doctor, right? Um, so that's something. And at the time, um, there's no data on chronic cough in Canada, unfortunately, but um, we recently were able to look at the prevalence of chronic cough in the Canadian Longitudinal Study of Aging. This is 30,000 participants that were recruited in 2010, and they've been followed up every three years. And they asked a question that, do you have a chronic cough every day for the last 12 weeks? Not eight weeks, 12 weeks. So you be, just be careful about that. And this is not everybody adults over the age of 18. You'll notice here that this is a middle-aged to older group of population. So just be careful about that. But the prevalence here is 16%. In the general community, does that surprise you, Vincent or Etri? That sixteen percent of the thirty thousand participants complained of a chronic cough. I am, I, I, to be honest, a little surprised in the sense of I think sometimes we can undervalue mm. something like cough, and I think Elena made a very good point of the fact that. Um, when we think of the grand scheme of things of getting older, sometimes we incorrectly attribute a lot of things to just aging in of itself yeah. and people not going in for certain things or not deciding to do certain things. Um, I hear this all the time in my fellow COPD patients that are just like, this is my smoker's cough. I've had this my whole life. And then we end up diagnosing them with very severe, yeah. unfortunate COPD. So that is 
it's in, it's good that this data came out of Canada because probably it's a, a larger issue than we're ever really realizing. And people don't think that there's treatment options or investigation options and just live with cough. True. Absolutely. So this um, is the second highest prevalence of chronic cough in the world after only after Australia, 18%. And you'll notice here that, as you mentioned, coughing does increase with aging. But the commonest thing, which is not surprising, is smoking. But even if you look at those people who don't smoke, it's still 10 to 12%. So it's still pretty high, right? And then we were able to look at provincial differences. And we noticed that in Quebec has the lowest prevalence and the lowest incidence of chronic cough, whereas Ontario has the highest. And this brings, again, this whole thing that Ellen talked about is social cultural issues uh, about whether they think, you know, it's the cough is bothersome enough that they want to actually go to somebody or say yes to a questionnaire. I had so, a quick question about yeah, Ontario yeah. versus Quebec. Yeah. Do you think the factor of occupational has any piece in this? Mm. My knowledge is Ontario tends to be more of a uh, like steel. A lot yeah. of yeah, pieces yeah. are here, whereas Quebec to the, I don't know much about Quebec. Yeah, that's a really, to the best really of my knowledge. Yeah, no, that's a very good question because when we published this paper around this thing, one of the reviewers did ask us that, oh, is it related to occupation? Is it related to weather? Is it related to climate? You know, what's the thing which is driving this difference? And and I didn't ha I don't have the answers yet, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but occupation certainly is something that I'm going to look into further. But 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 good question, Andrew. So, okay, so the next question is, and, and this is where we're going to be slightly more interactive and, and maybe the audience members will help you out as well. So if we um, now see this patient, Mr. Khalil, we've seen the referral, but now it's my cough clinic and, and, and I'm trying to do a history, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just um, imagine you're taking a history and these are the common titles or headings, history of preventing past medical history, drug history, social history, family history, occupational history. Uh, what kind of things would you want to ask in the history of the presenting illness? So you guys just shout out whatever you think is important. And I'll keep also a shout out in the chat to see what people, other people answer. But um, you can just go ahead and say whatever you think. Um, let's just start with Anana and then you, each one of you can say one thing. And then we will keep going faster. Hopefully, it will pick up. So, in the history of the presenting illness, you already know that the cough is going on for three years. So, I'll give you that already. We know that. So, three years. What else is important in the history of the presenting illness that you want to know about? Probably want to know like the whether it's a dry or productive cough. So, nature, Vincent. Yeah, I want to know other precipitating factor like cold temperature, any irritation. Good. Good. Yeah. Entry. What else would you want to know? Duration, nature, triggers. Um. So I would like to know. Sometimes I do ask in the history of presenting illness. My favorite thing to ask is, uh, why now for this cough? What's the bothersome? How is it affecting life? Okay, Which so how, how's it impact? So impact of cough. So I normally ask, you know, to what extent? Tell me about how is it impacting your family life, social life, work life. You know, tell me if it if it's affecting you physically, and I. I always ask, is it causing dizziness, syncope? Are you getting urinary incontinence because of coughing? Are you getting chest pain, stomach pains? Have you lost consciousness? Because these are big things, okay? Is there anything else, Eleanor, worrying signs or symptoms that you definitely want to ask that these are not the case? Mm -hmm. Just want to maybe uh, rule out any hemoptysis or something okay. like that. The red flags, so I'll put down red flags. So what red flags would you want to make sure they haven't got? Uh, yeah, like maybe blood in their sputum yeah, or like clubbing, like you mentioned. Anyone I would, Elena, Etri? I would think, I think Elena is definitely on the right track. I'd ask what we typically call in medicine, the constitutional symptoms. Yeah. So things like weight loss, uh, more fatigue, et cetera, to rule out like fevers, night sweats, to rule out a potential malignancy, unfortunately. So, so red flags to like malignancies so of hemoptysis, weight loss, fever and night sweats, particularly in Mr. Khalil, who I'll tell you is not born and brought up in Canada. He's from uh, the Middle East. And, you know, you may want to make sure he hasn't got TB, right? 
So those are good. So we've talked about duration, nature, triggers, impact, red flags. Okay. Uh, what else in the cough history that you might want to ask them, which I often ask people when I'm trying to think of, you know, how bad this cough is. Ellen, do you want, oh, Vincent or any, anybody else want to ask? I suppose you can ask about like how many times you're having the cough a day and okay, how you long. You can ask somebody, okay, yeah. tell me, you know, how many times do you think you cough per day? The problem with that question, Vincent, is that although it might sound very easy to us, people who cough many times a day for many years, they won't remember. They just can't remember because it's happening. And in fact, other people around them will notice, that, oh, you're coughing all the time and they'll think, oh, I'm fine. Okay. Um, but yeah, frequency you can ask about that, you know, how, how, how much do you think you cough? Eleanor, anything else about? Uh... Maybe like severity. So commonly we may ask like from a scale of zero to 10, like how bad do you find your cough in the past week or so? Good. So you can ask severity and you can ask it on a simple zero to 10 verbal numerical rating scale. Uh, somebody asked a very good point in the chat to say, look, we should ask people about, is it interfering with sleep? So nobody asked them, or, or do you just cough in the daytime when you wake up and in the afternoon and the evening, or do you actually cough in your sleep? That's a very good, important question. Uh, most people don't cough in their sleep. Most people, they wake up to go to the bathroom or something, and then they cough. So, but if they're coughing during sleep, that's a very important uh, sign or first thing in the morning sometimes can be helpful um do you think i think that's probably a good cough history that will give you the other thing i often ask um is have you tried anything over the counter what kind of things have you tried and you know tried medications so i often ask this okay what anything in the past medical history which you want to ask particularly related to cough which might you know or you can ask like a simple broad question just to keep it open but what, what would you ask in the past medical history in a, somebody who's got chronic cough? I often ask, you know, I try to get my answer ahead of time. Any <laughs> ever been diagnosed with any respiratory illness? Uh, 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 any lung diseases? <laughs> any lung diseases? Yes. So the patient, what, what do you mean? You know, you mean? it's very broad. So often I'll ask about either any asthma as a child, and then I'll ask about your triad, whether they've had some sort of allergies, whether family history is also a big genetic. Uh, yeah, asthma, uh, family history, seasonal allergies, yep. allergies. Okay, you can, I'll put that there. Okay. Anything you know, wouldn't it be great if they came to your clinic and they already had your <laughs> diagnosis? <laughs> yeah. um, but in the past medical history, obviously, you know, have you been told you have asthma, COPD, lung disease, uh, fibrosis? Or, you know, I, I ask about, do you have hypertension? Because that will make me think about what in the drug history. ACE inhibitor use. Yep, which this guy did have, right? Um, I also think about other things, slightly left field things in the past medical history, which you might not normally think. So people with cough who've been coughing hundreds of times a day for five ten years they can also develop something as a consequence of coughing so much and they're getting incontinence and they've lost their job and they're having problems with family what can what do you think might that impact their mental health maybe good so so i normally would ask about mental health that you know to what extent you know, have you had, do you have a history of uh, mental health disorders? Good. Imran, I'm just going to, there's two people who've suggested things. Um, Caroline says uh, to ask if they've ever had spirometry done. And then Donald says to ask about any travel history. Good. So I'm going to put spirometry in the investigation section. And actually, it's a very good point. And, and, and I actually don't always think about this, but because most of my patients are, you know, local Hamiltonians. But travel history is an important one, particularly if they've been to like a, you know, if they've, if they've you know, been to a TB endemic area or, you know, they might have picked up some unusual bugs or non-tuberculous mycobacteria like um, histio, histoplasmosis, something. So you've got to be slightly careful about not missing that. Good. So somebody else, as Caroline has uh, mentioned, you should ask about other associated um, uh, in the past medical history, you should ask about symptoms of GERD. And whilst we're at it, we should ask about symptoms of upper airway cough syndrome, broadly speaking. Okay. Um, 
I think we're filling this up pretty good. Anything in the social history other than that you might want to ask about? And obviously, I'll put this in smoking that comes for free. Um, what about vaping? Okay, marijuana and these things. Activity in the forest, yes. Um, that might be important, although I haven't seen many people with Lyme disease and cough, but uh, you never know. Tick bites and things. Actually, we saw a patient on Tuesday, Eleanor, who was a, uh, he used to work with trees and cutting trees in forest, in, 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 uh, he used to work in the forest. So actually, that's a good point. Um, occupations, I think, particularly people who are working with dusty environments. You know, I had a patient recently who had uh, silicosis. He's, he was uh, grinding gr a granite, making these, you know, the kitchen worktops and quartz and things. So, so the dusty environments, welders. These are the kind of jobs people, any, anything with industry. Interestingly, I, think... I get a lot of hairdressers and receptionists who use their uh, voice a lot and teachers. The, these are occupational hazards for chronic cough, singers even. So people who use their voice a lot. Um, I think I often ask, uh, and I think someone's also bringing in the chat for fungal, uh, sometimes something I get like um, a, a volunteer with the precariously homed is a cough coming from the environment that you live in, um, or whether there's like mites or something in that area, unfortunately, for whatever apartment. Yeah, or so that's a very good point. So we should ask about pets, house dust mites. House dust mites, unfortunately, are perennial, so it's very difficult to actually get rid of house dust mites unless you go to a completely wood flooring and everything. But often these mites live in mattresses and pillows and all sorts. Um, so uh, I think that's a pretty um, good list of um, things to mention. Alan Kaplan mentioned secondhand smoke. Um, Simon Hunter's mentioned impact on voice. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, exposure to inorganic dusts, yep, and particles. So these are all very good points in the history. And if you were to do that in my clinic, I'd be very impressed. Um, so that's a good history. Um, I think we should move on in time to examination. We've already got spirometry. Is there anything else you'd want to do? Vincent, anything that you would want to do after you see, you've seen the patient, and you're like, okay, we should do some investigations. We, we've, somebody's already mentioned spirometry. And why do we do spirometry? What, what, what's the point of doing it? What, what's the reason? You want to help diagnose you with what? Help diagnose if it... Asthma in this case. So asthma or uh, if it, you know, long smoking... Oh, like COPD. ...to various disease. Um, but it can also help with restrictive lung diseases if they've got pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, for asthma, you want to do reversibility assessment. So it's, it's not just spirometry. You want to give salbutamol afterwards as well. Um, but whilst they've got you in clinic, is there anything that you can do there and then in clinic as investigation? Would you do like a skin uh, pinprick test? Just yeah, you can do a pinprick that. test. And somebody else has mentioned that to, to see if they've got allergy testing, if they're allergic to anything. Um, chest x-rays somebody's put in Diane, Diane Lim, thank you chest x-ray is important uh, somebody's made a good point that uh, Alan's made a good point that uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria in Canada uh, is, is not from travel but you can just get it from in the water in, in, in Canada and is a high incidence in different areas uh, CBC Philip, Philippe has mentioned CBC. What, why, Eleanor, would we do a CBC? What is it in the CBC which might tell us something going on? Um, you can also look particularly at the blood eosinophil levels, which could be an indication of airway inflammation. Yeah. So it's not diagnostic, but it may help you to see, is it asthma or something called non-asthmatic eosinophil bronchitis, maybe? Or, or if there's like lymphopenia and there's, somebody's immunocompromised, then, you know, you might think, you know, is this infections and bronchiectasis? So you just in never the, know. In the question, somebody also mentioned to just auscultate the patient and also check for any issues with enlarged thyroid. 
sorry, I didn't catch that. Hang on. The, any see. issues with enlarged thyroid. Oh, enlarged thyroid, yes. You yeah. can ask. Yeah. And um hypothyroid or hyper graves disease. Graves. Um, you can ask in the chat. Let's see what else is in there, what other people think. Uh, CRP, upper airway issues. Yep. So how might you investigate um, or examine for upper airway, upper airway issues? What, or, or what test might you want to do? Or you might be worried about upper airways. There's something in the history, actually, which when somebody says they cough a lot, often they say, oh, this happens to me. I don't know, anybody can think of something in, in, in somebody with chronic cough might tell you that if you think, oh, they've got upper airway, this might be an indication that they have an upper airway issue. They often say this, that something happens. So often some people say, oh, I have a feeling of choking and really severe shortness of breath. And I feel as if um, I can't breathe and I lose my voice. I get a dysphonia. So that can be sometimes a sign of uh, upper airway syndrome or what we call vocal cord dysfunction. Um, and sometimes on the flow volume loop, you might notice that the inspiratory flow volume, it can be plateaued out or it can be some area, you know, fixed airway obstruction in the inspiratory loop. So you can look at the flow volume loop and you can also if you're really considered, the best thing to do is just to do a laryngoscopy. Okay, get get ENT to have a look to see, make sure it's moving properly. The vocal cords are moving properly. Okay, so I'm going to move on. We're at seven forty. I think we've done this as well. So um, I, I just want to point out that um, you know people who have got chronic cough. This is data from our group in Manchester, which shows that you know people who have chronic cough, on average, they're coughing around twenty coughs per hour. And often they'll be coughing for many, many years. So 20 coughs per hour per day, you're looking at 500 coughs per day. That's a lot of coughs, right? And imagine you're coughing 500 coughs per day for 10 years. Imagine how miserable you'd be, right? Um, and this is basically showing that, that this is the chronic cough group. In people who have got fibrosis, they cough quite a lot. COPD, they cough quite a bit between 8 to 10 coughs per hour and asthma can vary from two to 10 coughs per hour. And the other important thing is that healthy people do cough on average, you know, around half a cough per hour. So 12 coughs per day is considered normal. That's fine. Okay. Um, but, you know, half a cough per hour versus 20 coughs per hour is a big difference, right? And this is on a log scale, 24 hour objective cough frequency. And, and the reason I bring this up is that a lot of people also get sensations of irritation tickle in their throat or in their sternum and that's why in the history all of you pointed out that we should ask about local triggers of coughing and often the triggers are things like smoke dry perfume smells damp air cold air hot air some people or changes in temperature some people talking laughing and singing can trigger it during meals or after meals so these are things which normal people don't cough to but people with chronic cough, it tends to make them want to cough, okay? So this is something which we called um, allotusia, where it's a bit like allodynia, where things which are not painful make you, give you pain. So things which shouldn't necessarily make you want to cough or need you to cough makes people cough. So that we call the allotusia. And we also have something called hypertusia, where things which at low levels, like smoky, Smoking, you know, don't make most people cough, but um, low levels of smoke will make people cough. So hypertussia and allotussia are some of the terms that we people use. Uh, and we've already talked about it can have physical impacts such as sleep disturbance, syncope, urinary incontinence, exhaustion, chest pain and vomiting. It can cause social problems such as uh, social gatherings, medical consultations, treatment express, effects on family and work absenteeism. And it can cause psychological problems. Imagine you're coughing 500 times a day. You're going to be pretty depressed, anxious, and embarrassed and frustrated, particularly now in COVID times, where if you cough in public, they think you've got the plague, right? And, and, and people look at you in a funny way. 
but um, so it can it can have a significant um, impact um, on your um, uh, on, on your coughing, on your quality of life. Um, it can also affect your work. So this is some new data showing that if you have a productive or non-productive cough, you're more likely to have a poor work ability and you're more likely to have more sick leave. And in a multivariate analysis, uh, they demonstrated that the in, in males and females, there's approximately 50% higher odds um, of developing um, or having sick leave and a 30 to 40% reduced likelihood of having an excellent work ability score. So um, in this section, I want to talk to, or I want to ask Ellen to talk about what kind of tools you can use to assess cough and, um, oops, and what are the strengths and weaknesses. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move it along. Um, so Eleanor, do you want to say a few things about this? Section? Yeah. You're a bit of an expert on this, aren't you? Uh, I know a little bit. <laughs> um, so in chronic cough, we have both objective and subjective tools to measure cough. Um, in terms of objectively measuring cough, we can measure how many times a patient coughs. And Imran showed some data that demonstrated how many times chronic coughers cough on average per hour, which is measured using monitors. For example, the Vitalijack cough monitor. Uh, this is something that's primarily used for research purposes and isn't really available in clinic. Um, in clinic, you're more likely to use subjective instruments. So you may measure cough severity with a visual analog scale or asking them on a numerical rating scale from zero to 10, how bad is their cough? And, you know, if there's time, you can also consider using cough quality of life instruments like the Lester cough questionnaire um, uh, that's used in research, but can also be employed in clinic. Next slide. Um, I kind of talked a little bit about this, but this is sort of the gold standard way of measuring cough objectively using these Vitalijack cough monitors, but, you know, they're very expensive. Um, they're also very burdensome for patients to wear because um, they can't shower in the period that they're wearing them. And uh, it only measures coughs uh, in a 24 hour period. And we know from talking to chronic cough patients that their cough can vary day to day. And so sometimes the sampling doesn't, um, isn't fully representative of how bad their cough is. Uh, so uh, there's definitely a need to develop better instruments uh, to measure cough, both in the clinic and in research. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, and so um, uh, with our cough research program uh, run by Dr. Sadia Imran, uh, we're developing actually a, a subjective tool to measure cough severity, which hopefully um, can be used both in clinic and in research. So I'll take this next section because many of you have been thinking about, okay, we, we've learned how to assess and manage cough just at the very simple level. But the, but the bigger question is, why do people cough in the first place, right? So if I ask you to cough now, I can ask you, you can think about it, and you can just cough, right? So it's important to realize that cough is both under voluntary and involuntary control. That's an important thing that you will remember, uh, Vincent, is that I bet in your life you've, you have coughed without thinking, right? It just happened. Can you remember when it happened? The last time you coughed with that thing, it just, it just happened. <laughs> Did you get COVID? No, no COVID yet. Probably okay. allergies or something. Okay. So, you know, you, or, or you walked into a smoky room or something and you've been exposed to something and it just triggers a cough, right? And it just, it, it just happened without you thinking. And other times you can cough because you voluntarily think about it and make you cough. So that's important. So, if we go back to this basic neurophysiology and we have the brain here and you have these nuclei called the jugular and nodose ganglion, which are behind the ear, and they send out these afferents to the airways. And when you stimulate this, it generates action potentials will go to the brain, to the somatosensory cortex, and it can get a throat irritation and we've all felt it. And then if that's great enough, it will go through an urge to cough and eventually that'll make you cough. That's what normally happens. But in some people, this pathway has become very sensitive. And that's why we think that some people stop coughing to these low levels of thermal, mechanical, and chemical stimulation. 
talking, laughing, singing, changes in temperature, cold air, perfumes, aerosols, bleach, anything can trigger it. Um, but also what we do know is that these nerve endings in the airways, the esophagus, and in the nose, they can become sensitized. So if, if you imagine these nerve endings, if there's lots of mucus or inflammation or eosinophils or acidity or something, you know, rhinitis in the nose, it's a possibility that those nerve endings become sensitive. And then the next time you're exposed to something, it just starts kicking you off and, and just makes you want to cough. So there's issues you can get increased stimulation or the nerve itself might become hyper excitable, which we think is possibility. Or the third thing is that maybe that the brain itself has become too sensitive or that the inhibitory neurons in the brain, which normally should be firing, are not working very well. And there's now evidence to suggest that as well. So I often think of the neurophysiology that either there's too much stimulation, so too much stimulation, or the nerve has become too hyper excitable, or the brain is too sensitive, or the brakes will come off. Um, I'm gonna go past this much quickly. So how to treat chronic cough? Um, this is something which we've been thinking about in Canada, and I'm very grateful that Dr. Alan Kaplan is also on the call, uh, because we wanted to develop a pathway to try and help people um, get to grips with how to investigate and manage chronic cough. So here we've developed a step one and two for primary care where we, so the, I hope now you've, we've talked about this, check for this, test um, spirometry plus or minus reversibility, chest x-ray and CBC. I think you all got that and you got the red flags. And then as you said, that if you stop smoking, chase, change the ACE inhibitor, and if there's evidence of asthma, COPD, chronic rhinosinusitis, or GERD, then you obviously treat according to those things that you identify. If you don't identify those conditions, don't randomly treat people without an underlying diagnosis. That's an important message. If they haven't got reflux, they haven't got heartburn, indigestion, bloating, cough, which is worse after meals or during meals, then I wouldn't randomly give people two months of treatment antacids. But if the cough persists, like in this guy, so Mr. Khalil, he had a chest x-ray, which was normal. His perindopril was changed to amlodipine. And he was given nasal inhaled steroids for possible allergic rhinitis. He did lifestyle changes. And a month later, he comes back with dry cough. And his nasal symptoms and heartburn heart are still present. So you give him pantoprazole before meals, OK, to try and control the acidity. And you're started on intranasal corticosteroids. So you think, okay, I think he's got GERD. Let's treat the GERD. He's got inhaled nasal symptoms. Give him some steroids. We've changed the ACE inhibitor. So we've done everything in step one and two, right? Nobody can fault you. So what do you do next? This is the problem, right? So they come to secondary care now. So we want to now look at this more carefully and say, okay, does he have asthma? Does he have uncontrolled inflammation? Should we, be, should we consider doing a methacholine challenge? I think somebody in the chat, I think it might have been Alan or somebody else, I think Philippe mentioned we should consider doing methacholine challenge. Sometimes we can do sputum eosinophil measurement or a pheno if it's available to measure a surrogate marker of eosinophilic inflammation. If you're really considered about reflux and disease, then you might do a 24-hour pH impedance and high-resolution manometry. In certain cases, if you think they've got inducible laryngeal obstruction or muscle tension dysphonia, you might send them to the ENT and have a look with a laryngoscopy. Then I would normally do a cough severity and quality of life assessment and then treat based on this. And if they still persist, then I would say, hey, they've got refractory or unexplained refractory because you've identified reflux, asthma, nasal disease, and you've given them treatment. But despite treating well, they're still coughing. So then I would consider speech pathology, or these neuromodulators called pregabalin, gabapentin, low-dose morphine, or amitriptyline. And then you try one of these, and if it's still worse, then you either try an alternative or start them into recruitment to a clinical trial. But if they do get benefit, then it's important to monitor, monitor for side effects and to try titrate down to the lowest dose possible. Is there any specific neuromodulator that you prefer? Could this... good, good question. Um, we, we'll come to that in a second. 
but actually this is a, this is often something which i think about on a daily basis because the truth is i i don't know and there's no strong evidence to tell you oh you should give morphine or you should give amitriptyline or you should give pregabalin or gabapentin what i do know is in canada people are very very reluctant to give morphine because of the opioid epidemic and patients are scared that they're going to get addicted so so just be careful but anyways our friend mr khalil he has a bronchial challenge methacholine which doesn't show any bronchial hyper responsiveness so it's unlikely they've got asthma okay and we do a pheno level, which is exhaled nitric oxide, which is a surrogate marker of eosinophilic inflammation. And it's 18, which is, which is normal. If it was 45 or 50 or 60, then I'm thinking, okay, it may be, there may be some underlying eosinophilic inflammation. And I might want to give them oral prednisone or inhaled steroid. Because I think there could be something called non-asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis. But he doesn't. Okay. I don't, we don't think. So his heartburn symptoms have resolved, which is good. And his rhinorrhea has helped, but he's still complaining of a chronic dry cough. So what can we try now? And this is the bit which I often struggle with um, because these are our options. But one thing I will point out is none of these treatments are licensed for chronic cough. They're licensed for pain relief, epilepsy, seizures, and, and nerve type pain. And we use them off label for chronic cough. And some people are not happy about that. And, and some physicians, you know, feel very scared about doing things like this. And you got to remember that there's only, for each of these treatments, there's only one randomized control trial. One for morphine, one for pregabalin, one for gabapentin, and one uncontrolled study for amitriptyline. And each of those studies has 20, 30 patients. So very low numbers. So because of that, some people are not particularly keen on trying those. But I can tell you that because I run a cough clinic, I often try people with morphine and in some people there's a dramatic benefit about 40 to 50 percent but you've got to make sure that um you know you've you've ruled everything else out um and somebody's mentioned tussinex and tussinex has a bit of codeine in it or opioid and it has a bit of uh or dextromethorphan or sometimes they have graphenazine or menthol like medications these these mixtures uh and the idea is is that these medications they work on the central nervous system to suppress those cough signals going up to the brain and making you want to cough okay uh, but this is the evidence and the evidence isn't great as you can see so anyways uh he comes back mr khalil he's seen the um ent surgeon who says that oh he thinks that there's a bit of laryngeal pharyngeal reflux um but he's not sure it's because of that also because if you cough hundreds of times a day then your throat will be red um, and edematous. So we're not sure is the edema that we're seeing because of the coughing or is it because actually because of reflux. Um, but he continues um, to have some reflux symptoms and he has a gastroscopy, which doesn't reveal any abnormalities. But I try him on a domperidone, which is a prokinetic. Sometimes I try people on azithromycin to speed up the GI motility. Um, he, he's also referred for speech therapist as part of one of our studies. And he says that it certainly helped with throat clearing um, and the urge to cough. Uh, but his, he, he feels quite impaired with the cough. Uh, so what now? So I tried him on low dose morphine. And I only tried them on a 14 day trial first, because if, if it's going to work, the patient will know within two weeks. If it doesn't work, it's not going to work beyond that. And I normally ask people, you know, what's the cough severity before and after? And I say, okay, it's gone from nine out of 10 to seven out. So there's a partial response. I wouldn't say there's a complete response. There's a partial response. Um, and this is the reason why there's such a big unmet need for developing new cough treatments. I'm going to stop it there. Uh, and I'm not going to talk too much about this, but uh, I want to leave a couple of minutes for question and answers. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody. Um, and um, the main message from today's talk is that cough is a common problem. It requires, um, uh, you know, a systematic approach. Uh, it impacts people's quality of life. We think it happens because of vagal neuronal dysfunction. It's important to rule out serious disease. Unfortunately, just two two weeks ago, I had a patient with lung cancer and chronic cough, and and people had been putting it off for a while, and then it, you know it ends up you know the CT scan shows that he's got cancer. So. 
it's important not, not to miss cancers. So you've got to be a, a good general respiratory physician to, to, to rule out the other stuff, bad stuff. Um, and, and you can use basic zero to 10 numerical rating scores. Um, if you've got more time, you can do the questionnaires if, 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 it's, if, if you can. And you can, if somebody truly has refractory and unexplained chronic cough, then you can try speech therapy or you can try uh, centrally acting neuromodulators. Um, but um, I, I'm going to stop my share screen uh, to make it easier for me to um, ask any questions or anybody has any uh, thoughts or comments. I know at the end we had to go a bit faster than I had wanted, but I think we did a really good job, a thorough job in the history and exam. And we had a really good discussion uh, at the beginning end, but I, I thought I'd want to speed things up towards the end. But I hope you all learned something and I hope uh, the attendees also learned uh, the basics of even how to do a, a cough history. And, and I'm really grateful for Alan, Philippe, um, and I think... Um, Caroline also has some really good points uh, and Diane Lim for, for joining and, 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 and also giving their input. Imran, if we have one little minute, um, actually there was one, just one feedback, one comment here that was not the answer. It says, how about post-viral dry cough uh, without bronchoreactivity, post-nasal drip that interrupts sleep? In such cases, I'll give a short course of uh, TUSIONX. Yeah. yeah, I didn't mention that yet. Sometimes Tussinex can help suppress the cough, but um, normally my, my rule of thumb is that I, I'd want to make sure that I'm not um, suppressing the cough and there's an, actually an underlying problem. Sometimes I get a bit twitchy giving people cough suppressants without doing a chest x-ray or spirometry because sometimes that will just suppress or, you know, the, the cough might get better, but they might have COPD or they might have asthma or they might have something, a bronchiectomy, something might else be there. But because you've suppressed the cough, then they might feel as if, oh, it's not a problem anymore. Um, uh, do you ever do a CT scan? I, I do sometimes do CT scans, uh, Diane, because sometimes um, the chest X-ray, if particularly when they've been coughing up phlegm, or if they've ever said I coughed up a tiny bit of blood, I have a very low threshold for doing CT scans. So, um, Diane, that you know, and, and often sometimes doing a CT scan and telling the patient your CT scan is completely normal, it can be a huge relief for patients, a big relief for patients, because they feel that, oh, I haven't got cancer. And that can be helpful in and of itself. Um, there's a couple of quick questions. Um, it can be difficult to do spirometry. Uh, in somebody who has cough, you're absolutely right, Caroline. Um, some people who have bad chronic cough, when when they're doing the deep inhalation, they'll go <laughs> and they'll start coughing. So sometimes it's very difficult to do spirometry, and and um, um, you know it, it is a problem. Um, and sometimes, therefore, I ask people to do a slow maneuver, a slow VC. So when you go, instead of doing really hard, really fast, I, I take a deep, slow, deep breath in and then take a slow, deep breath out and do a slow vital capacity maneuver. Um, there's another question, quick one. Uh, if spirometry is negative, would you still consider a trial of ICS? If the spirometry is normal, uh, I do a reversibility assessment, particularly if there's some reduction in FEV1. I would then do a methacholine challenge. If the methacholine is negative, then I wouldn't give them inhaled steroids or bronchodilators. But if I think that the bloody eosinophil count is high or the pheno is high, I have access to sputum eosinophils. So I will do sputum in everybody. Because sometimes spirometry is normal, methacholine is normal, but pheno is high, bloody eosinophil is high, and sputum is high. Uh, blood, sputum eosinophil is high. So therefore, these people have non asthmatic eosinophilic bronchitis and they do benefit from ICS. And in some people, I actually give them a two-week course of prednisone and then switch them over to ITS to really see if it's going to benefit. And that can be a tr tricky diagnosis to make. Um, and in primary care, some people will just take the pragmatic option and say, well, you know, I haven't got access to these fancy tests, so I'm just going to give them prednisone. But, but just be careful that, um, uh, you know, you, prednisone might be treating pulmonary fibrosis as well. 
I think Alan has access to Fino, and, and some of you may have access to Excel Nitric Oxide, which you can use as well. Um, um, so Methacholine Challenge, um, we have it at McMaster. You can request it at McMaster University Medical Center, St. Joseph's Hospital. So most hospitals should have it. Um, um, so you can request it. Um, it shouldn't be a problem. Uh, some people also have Manitol as well, uh, if, if you want to use that. Uh, there's some questions related to, uh, are there any opportunities for med students to get involved? Definitely, you can contact me. We have a, we have a lot of projects that you can help with. Uh, so you can contact me for, for research um, opportunities and uh, we can get you uh, to help us. What is the benefit of codeine compared to morphine? Um, there's actually no benefit to be perfectly honest. Um, the study that was done for codeine was actually negative. The study for morphine was positive. And codeine is a bit of a dirty drug because you eat it, you swallow it, it absorbs it, it goes to the liver, it then gets metabolized to the op opioid. So it's dependent on liver metabolism. So you get all sorts of, you know, PKPD problems. So, uh, but having said that, some people would say, I don't want to take morphine, but I'll try codeine. So I'm like, okay, if nothing else has worked and you're desperate for treatment, let's try you in codeine. And there are a handful of patients I have who do take codeine. So, so yes. Okay. Uh, um, I think I've answered all, all the questions. Uh, yes, you, you have a, quite a person. I, I just want to give really a, a big, big thanks to all of you uh, in the panelists, Elena, Vincent, Etri, and Imran, of course. It was fantastic. I love the concept. I hope that this will be probably the lead for an uh, upcoming series. I, I believe the topic also is super important, especially in med schools. I, I can see now the, the, the need. So uh, very, very happy about, about the work that that you guys are doing and uh, thank you everyone who joined us uh, late in the evening and uh, this webinar as you know is being recorded and there's going to be um, an opportunity to view it later on on our youtube channel or on the expandcourses.com platform so thank you very much everyone thank you have a nice evening thanks guys i'd be grateful if you can fill out the uh, the feedback forms and tell me a bit about who you are and where you work and what your role is it will give me a useful tips on how to improve this in the future uh, this is the first time we've tried something like this so uh, anyways thank you all very much for attending thank you very much Bye.